Cassidy with Novo Nordisk, Scott Schober with BBS, and Dave Weinstein, the Director of Cybersecurity for New Jersey Homeland Security. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me. Um, again, my name is Cindy Michelli. Um, at my firm, Alta, we focus on placing cybersecurity executives. And as such, over a 30 year history, we have definitely witnessed uh, numerous trends and required skill sets and areas of focus. In this past year, uh, we have noticed the changing tide has swept in a particular need for data protection and the idea of data leveraging. Um, strong DLP experience is now becoming incorporated into the majority of the job descriptions that I see on a daily basis, whether that's from staff up to C level. Um, in fact, just a few months ago, I personally had the opportunity to serve as our point person in partnering with a major market leader, a Fortune 10 company, in hiring their first time chief data officer. Um, that individual is now busy on the conference circuit um, promoting the role of a CDO. And that was really, um, I must say, probably the most challenging search of my 20 year recruitment career. Um, I have placed CISOs post breaches, um, and this CDO search almost killed me. Uh, there, was just, there was just simply a lack of the right type of focus skill set out there. So I'm glad to see that there's opportunities for discussion and a focus being put on these topics like we're doing today. Um, I'm sure that you too are here because you are also in process of identifying, classifying, protecting, and starting to think about, if you haven't already, how are you gonna better leverage all this data to make additional business opportunities for your firm's futures? And so as you're starting to shift culturally, uh, we hope that some of today's discussions will assist you on this journey. Uh, we developed a few key questions uh, that we'd like to share with you and then look forward to your comments and questions towards the end. So if I may, I'm gonna begin with Dave at the end. And what we'd like for you to share with us, if you'd be as kind, is you know what has changed in the last year uh, in Homeland Security regarding how we specifically define or classify data? And what are some of the particular standards that you're now following to help you do so? Thanks, Cindy, and, and thanks, Jim, and, and the council for, ha for having me. Um, I guess I'll answer that question quite simply by saying that it's now really important uh, for the non-technical executive man management across the state of New Jersey. So what's, what's changed primarily is people are paying attention. People are paying attention to issues that have traditionally existed in the IT space, as well as the Homeland Security space. Now, in New Jersey, uh, we're, we're, I'm focused on Homeland Security as well as uh, the IT enterprise writ large. So we, we, generally speaking, apply a lot of the same thinking around data classification across the enterprise, whether, it, whether it's focused on Homeland Security data, law enforcement data, or data that's proprietary to uh, various agencies across across state government. But the biggest trend that I've seen uh, has been all of a sudden people are starting to pay attention. And it's not just the CISOs, it's not just the CIOs, it's commissioners across the agencies, it's the governor's office. And this is a phenomenon I think that we're seeing at all levels of government. I've been on the phone with numerous mayors across the state of New Jersey who call our office in a panic because they can't access uh, all of their administrative uh, data to to operate their their municipal government. Uh, so it's it's struck a nerve, uh, undoubtedly over the last year. I think we've already talked a fair amount about ran ransomware, and that's played a major role in uh, elevating this issue to the C-suite, so to speak. Um, I will say we we put a lot of more structure around how we at the state level classify data, and I think we've we've moved to a point where we're less conservative about how we classify data. So uh, that, that's another trend that I would point out. Um, there's nothing terribly innovative about the, the way we, uh, we classify and, and organize data and security controls around our information. We have public information, we have secure information, 
confidential information as well as uh, personal information. Now, uh, for the most part, we, we define those different classification levels the same way industry does, the same way the federal government does. Public information is public. Uh, secure information is usually reserved for business purposes, but not entirely sensitive. Uh, secure or confidential information is sensitive. This includes a lot of the law enforcement data, a lot of homeland security data that we deal with. And then, of course, personal information is usually governed or controlled by some sort of uh, some sort of federal regulation or, or standard. What has changed, I would say, is how we control the access to that data. So uh, we have four levels of authentication uh, classifications across the state government. Again, this applies to the Homeland Security Enterprise. It applies to all the departments of state government. And we try to preach this, frankly, to the, the 500 some odd municipalities across the state. Uh, but there's been a big movement towards getting away from multi, from single factor authentication with, with limited identity proofing towards multi factor authentication uh, with, uh, with tokenization and, and very uh, stringent identity proofing procedures. Um, you know, we, we talk a lot about the, uh, the, the, the password and how it's inherently insecure. Um, so it's not necessarily about how we classify the data, it's about how we control access to that data, and authentication has, has a lot to do with that. So we've, we've put uh, what we characterize as level three and four controls for accessing that data around uh, data that is typically only required level two, or in some cases level one, just to provide that, that extra uh, layer of activity or layer of uh, security. Uh, we as well have uh, have brought in a chief data officer, so I think it's important to note that there needs to be seamless integration between the chief data officer, the CISO, as well as the CIO. Those are three uh, three kind of crucial roles in terms of this discussion. It's not just a security discussion. It's not just a data discussion. It's not just a technology discussion. There's touch points between all three roles. Uh, we're working the process out in our organizations, not only at the enterprise level, but within the agencies, about how those roles and responsibilities intersect. Uh, but that's been, that's been a really central theme across state government, is integrating uh, what, what is a new role into a legacy uh, framework of CIO and CISO. I'll also add, um, and then we won't hog up all the time, but data tagging has been uh, really important for us, right? And this is a subject uh, that I think doesn't get discussed enough, at least in government circles, um, being really smart about how we tag data. Uh, and, and oftentimes in government, we get a little lazy uh, because uh, we, we, we don't necessarily consider the financial impact of over tagging. Uh, whereas folks in the private sector uh, are, are forced to be a little more conservative when it comes to tagging data uh, for the purpose of identifying it, whether it's for compliance purposes, whether it's for incident response purposes. Uh, but we focused a lot uh, on, on creating a schematic around how we, how we think about tagging data in a really efficient and, and non-overburdensome manner um, and then lastly, I'll close by saying, I'm sure this has been discussed already, this whole notion of a data diet. We, we really need to go on a data diet in government writ large. Uh, we have duplicative data records all across uh, our enterprise. It's something we're really prioritizing uh, at a very high level when it comes to, to, to data management across the state. Um, it's not an easy process. Um, but it's one that I think is going to pay dividends for us down the road in terms of not only reducing our risk, but also reducing the cost of managing all of our data assets. I think the idea of a data diet is, is very much uh, of interest, and actually, interestingly enough, did not come up today in particular. Would you mind walking us through in a high level what exactly that means? Is it simply eliminating redundancies, or is it more than that? Well, so we're, we're trying to, to walk before we walk, we run. 
the first step uh, is re eliminating redundancies. Uh, the second step is eliminating data that is just unnecessary, data that you don't need. Um, and sometimes this, this gets into the metadata discussion as well, which I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but um, you know, as, as, we, uh, as we kind of take on a larger cyber footprint, so to speak, and in particular introduce uh, the Internet of Things into our enterprise environment, we're dealing with a lot of metadata that we have not here before dealt with. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's a, it's a phased process for us. It starts with um, removing uh, redundant data sources, but then it, it requires taking a high level look at all of our data and saying, what data do we actually need and not need, and how do we dispose of the data that we don't need? Very good, thank you. Uh, the next question I'd like to ask Mr. Schober, um, what are your current goals for data? Um, how exactly are you leveraging it? You know, as the president and CEO, uh, obviously you're seeing it as an asset. <laughs> sure. Well, well, first of all, uh, thanks for having me here. Appreciate it, Jim and, and JTC and certainly the sponsors and all. Um, thinking about data, I always try to break it down, first of all, and, and everybody really does, whether it's personal data, whether it's within your corporate structure, do you need to stay anonymous? It really depends. And if you don't categorize it or break it down, it's hard to really effectively protect it and can keep it safe. So sometimes you have to do some analysis, even within a corporation. A lot of the stuff we send, emails and other things, they're not that proprietary. Uh, however, if you're sending, if, if it's software, if it's IP, if it's schematics, if it's drawings, other things that are really proprietary in nature to your organization, that, that's your bread and butter, you don't you protect it. End-to-end -end encryption, obviously, you have to think, does it need to be anonymous? Do you sell internationally to other countries, as was mentioned? We certainly do. We've had products, we've had IP compromised as a result of our data being compromised. So it doesn't have to be a giant organization and spies going through. It can happen to anyone in this room if you're one or two people in a corporation or a large corporation. So you really have to think about the data and, and I, it really maybe to build on David's point, I like what he mentioned, and I found it true too. Um, the sharing has changed. The understanding of breaches and how sensitive our data is has really um, dramatically changed just from the beginning of last year. I think back, um, I did a segment, uh, it was January 2015 on ransomware on NPR with Brian Krebs and, and uh, someone else from Symantec. And we talked about ransomware. As a result of it, most people I talked to had no clue what ransomware was. They're looking at me saying, what is it again? They're hijacking, they're encrypting bitcoins, what is that? Again and again, the very basic things I was explaining. Now it's interesting, come full circle a little more than a year later, people are understanding what ransomware is now. The problem hasn't gone away, it's actually gotten a lot worse. I think this quarter alone, $209 million uh, in ransomware funds were, were stolen. That's only what's reported just in this first quarter. So the problem's getting much worse, the strains are getting worse, so really people's data, companies' data, is paramount. So how do we protect it? What are some things we can do? It always goes back, at least in my discussions, to everybody, what I've learned, because uh, we share, we've been in business in New Jersey 44 years. We're developing IP, we're developing test tools and security tools for, for DOD agent, agencies, wireless threat detection tools, as well as cellular-based tools to build out our cell towers. And the data and the proprietary information that we have is paramount to our business. That's our secret sauce. So we have to protect it, yet we were compromised. So if we can be compromised and we understand security, we understand wireless, what's going to prevent the average person, the average company? And most of the stuff that I, I, I've delved into and have learned over the years, it does go back to best practices and the fundamental things. As was mentioned before, it's easy for us to check email and have access for things and we use insecure passwords. Many people will not use multi-factor, two-factor authentication. It's not that much more work, yet people are just lazy. That's what I, I fundamentally see, and I hear it again and again every time I talk to people. Even sometimes it's room filled with security experts that have a lot of important data, and they say the same thing. When you talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, you know, 
I'm going to go change my password after you mention that. <laughs> so it, it's not something we should all be embarrassed about, I don't think. At first I was when our company was compromised. It became a federal investigation. I felt stupid. I got a phone call, people at an Associated Press, can I interview? Can I ask you, what did you do wrong? And what mistakes did you make? And I was like, oh, I feel like an idiot. But the more and more I disclosed and shared, the more I learned so it doesn't happen again, and the more I try to educate people. So I always view data really kind of fundamental to your question. We have to be proactive about it. And it has to really be done from the top down. It's not just about talking about making a strong password or backing up our information so we're, we're not victims of ransomware there. Just to add to that too, because we talked about ransomware and it's such a growing problem. When you do make the backup, what's the most important thing to do? Disconnect it. A lot of people forget that one critical aspect of, of ransomware, because a lot of us will plug in, we'll back it up, great. If you don't disconnect from the computer and the network, guess what? You're still vulnerable. It's very, very important that we do that. And, and I still, I'm a strong believer, I've been arguing from day one, don't pay the ransom. Um, I understand the reason why people pay the ransom. There are, if you get down in the dark web, there are lists of, of the sucker list. Once you pay the ransom, you're on that list. Guess what? They're going to keep going after you with a different stream. So you really, you, you don't get away with much. I know people can argue it and say, well, the time, the money, the effort, but I don't have a backup, but it is really challenging. Now, in your organization, obviously the IT security organization is protecting the data. Who kind of owns it? Is that departmentalized, or are you also shifting towards a centralized function? Well, as far as uh, who owns the data, I always say, I own the data. I, I view it this way. I always bring up the argument of, of Apple versus FBI, and that's a, a tough one, probably not enough time here, but I think it's a very interesting conversation, because it doesn't just affect Apple or the government, it really affects all of us. Privacy and security is fundamental. If you view it from Apple's standpoint, which I'm obviously an Apple user here and a long fan of theirs and a strong proponent of theirs, their whole business model is based upon security. Not, not just hardware encryption, but also software encryption and an entire mindset and culture of keeping data safe so they can't compromise and ever give the back door of the magic keys away. That, that's my argument and I stand, stand behind them. What the FBI was asking is not what's reported on either, which is kind of a little misleading. Both sides played the media a little bit, but in that case, what they're really asking for was a forensics kit. Not just the backdoor key to unlock that iPhone. If you really read the specific case, it goes into a forensics kit that says the know-how, the IP, how to have access into the secure enclave, the encryption algorithms, everything else that's inside the phone, which fundamentally would lead them to the next generation phone and so on and so forth. So if you look at that, that was a landmark case, in my opinion, to tell everybody that data is, is what this is all about. And everybody's talking about big data. How do we keep it protected? How do we keep it secure? I mean, obviously, the, the FBI director will maybe argue a little bit different because that it's, it's hard to get into phones. And guess what? Everybody's turned their game up and made encryption very, very difficult now. Wait till you see the next generation, iPhone 7, 8, Android devices, so on and so forth. It's going to be very difficult to have any access to anyone's data. And those rules change, obviously, from the U.S. perspective, especially once we get international. Very good. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Cassidy, I'm using last names formally because we have two Scots. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is father, he says. Um, as the director of IT security for Nova Nordisk, you know, what are you guys seeing as your future concerns, goals, hopes, uh, for uh, for data, uh, and, and what are you turning towards to gather your information? Uh, again, nice to be here, and I think for us, <clears throat> part of the the future is going to be a lot like the past and the present. Where for any of organizations, it, it's not going to be one size fits all. I think as a career long technologist and someone who has a genetic predisposition for loving complexity and technology, I mean, I probably spent. Uh, Many, many treasured hours as a youth with the bell lap systems, telephone switching manual, just, you know, it's there. You, you, you naturally look towards technology to kind of solve your problems. Um, some of you may have very secure information security programs, very data driven, very modern. That's fantastic. Many of you may not. And I would say one thing I look at as you move into the future is, is don't develop your programs from the solution backwards. Really focus on the fundamentals. Really start looking about what's critical assets within your organization, whether they're information systems or people, and model controls around those, particularly in terms of data. 
gain an understanding around where it is, make sure that those controls follow the data. I mean, it really comes back to the basics in many, many ways. Some of the, some of the most effective mindsets that you can have to approach these challenges in the future are the same of the 1960s or 70s, looking at things like least privilege and need to know in terms of managing access to data, uh, having robust identity and access management. You know, these, one of the most important things you can do is redact access if someone transitions job roles or leaves the organization. Uh, compartmentalization of your network and your data. Again, that helps you know contain propagation. Uh, again, somebody mentioned data housekeeping. We have it all over the place. You really need all of that type of data. You know, awareness training. It really goes back and I hate to have another crypto locker thing, but it's almost silly that it's such a big problem because if you had the fundamentals in place, it would almost be a non-issue. You know, someone had mentioned, I think Mary had mentioned keeping a cool head there. I can remember the very first time I saw a, a, a lucky infestation and it's propagating across file shares and people are like, you know, it's, it's 100 gigs, 500 gigs, 800 gigs. And people are just in a panic and you, know, you walk out of the room for a minute, they're like, it stopped. And like, what, what did you do? And we could disable the account that was running under an active directory. I mean, so uh, you really have to look at things like that. And all the things we mentioned are, are, are help address it. Technology can help you do this on a much larger scale, much more efficiently. I think in our organization, we're fortunate enough to be really 10 years into our operational security program. A lot of lessons learned, a lot of improvements, and that's, uh, but it all comes back to processes. And almost everything that we do, I think the, the most important aspect that we have to our security program that helps us get ready for the future is we run everything through the meat filter. I mean, there's always a human involved. A human considering data, a human looking at situations, the single most important asset you can have to protect your organizations is a thinking person, someone who's well trained, enabled, allowed to make mistakes. Because you know, don't don't build your programs around a particular threat. Because threats do and will change sometimes very rapidly. But if you have those fundamentals in place and have the right people and know what's important in your organization, whether it's data systems or individuals, and kind of use that to shape the focus of your program, I think you'll be highly successful. How do you manage, you know, budgeting enough time and funds to prepare for the future and what your future program needs to look like while also monitoring and protecting today? What percentage, how do you keep that balance? Uh, I, I think the most important thing there to be effective in terms of securing resources, whether it's time or finance, to, to implement a good program and address threats is, is avoid fear-based marketing. Uh, one of the most important things you can do is align with the business. The, the whole reason you're here, and in most organizations anyway, is to ensure prevention of business disruption, protection of intellectual property, uh, understanding the business, working close to the business. That's where your focus should be. You never want to focus on security just because it's interesting to you or because it's, it's sexy. Um, really, sometimes the most effective things you can do are the simplest. When you can align that with business and you can make them champions of what they're doing and be a good communicator. I mean, I used to say jokingly as I went around to the different business units and worked with people said, what's, what's important to you? What data is important to you? What would stop business if, if it wasn't available to you? You couldn't utilize there, you know, it's half jokingly. So look, we're, we're from IT security. We're not happy until you're not happy. Uh, but you know, no, nothing could be further from the truth. It's, it's, it's a partnership. You need to you know, help them manage those risks and you don't know what the risks are to manage until you actually can talk to them. And, uh, it, it's very important to understand exposures. It's very important to understand your weaknesses, but you'll never be able to fix them all, remediate them all. What you want to do is have a have a threat threat modeling to understand what's the probability of risk, what's the impact of risk. Focus your attention there, and then when you get those issues addressed, you can start to work out the more the the, the edge cases, the mathematically less probable, but, but know that you won't do it all. Thank you. I'd like to open up to questions and comments. So, I know people have mentioned the government and Homeland Security before, maybe not so positively, but I know you guys are proactive and I know under your leadership um, and Chris's that you guys are trying to spread you know, good information amongst the businesses in the state to make them more prepared. So can you give some, you know, an update on, on what the state is doing for the business community? Sure, thanks. 
Thanks for that softball, by the way. <laughs> Be happy to. How much time do we have? Um, no, thanks. And uh, we have done a fair amount um, over the last year at the state of New Jersey. And you keep in mind, uh, cybersecurity beyond the enterprise level is a new phenomenon for state and local governments across the nation. So um, in many respects, uh, to the credit of the governor and, and the director of Homeland Security, I think we've been a bit ahead of the curve, particularly in the threat intelligence analysis and sharing space. So a year ago on May 20th, uh, we stood up our first state level information sharing and analysis organization in ISAO. Uh, not to be confused with ISAC, which is the Information Sharing Analysis Center. Still trying to figure out what the, what the difference is. Nevertheless, um, it's called the New Jersey Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Cell. And it's modeled after the US Department of Homeland Security's National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center. And our mission is actually pretty simple. It's to promote statewide awareness among govern governments, businesses, and citizens of cyber threats and inform best practices and promote the adoption of best practices based on an understanding of the current threat landscape. And one of our competitive advantages, so to speak, aside from the fact that we provide free services, uh, is that we work very hard to distill complex threat intelligence into highly consumable and actionable uh, information for a very diverse constituency across the, the state of New Jersey with a very keen focus on small businesses and, and local governments. So those organizations that don't have you know, $450 million budget like JP Morgan and Chase to commit to, to cybersecurity and data protection. Um, we're also positioned rather nicely, I think, to kind of bridge the information sharing gap between states and the federal government. So uh, we kind of have our own collection posture, so to speak, based on the 1,500 or so sensors distributed across the state government, 15 departments, dozens of, of authorities and commissions. We're ingesting all that data. We're taking about 1.7 billion suspicious or you know, security events per day, getting that down through standard rules set to about a million suspicious events and then applying our own institutional knowledge and correlation rule sets to publish about 12 to, to 15 uh, really actionable cyber threat indicators per day for anyone in New Jersey. Um, and we're, we're sharing that information in, in an automated fashion. Uh, so you know we're very cognizant of the fact that uh, we're constantly playing catch up to the attackers, and that unless we're dealing in automation when it comes to information sharing, we're always gonna be one step behind. So we have a full-time staff of analysts and engineers who are dedicated to this problem, and, and ultimately our constituency is the citizens, businesses, and governments of, of New Jersey. It's very much uh, cybersecurity as a, as a public service for the state of New Jersey. So uh, I would encourage everyone to go to our website in a shameless plug, uh, cyber.nj.gov. Uh, ransomware has been a hot topic uh, today. I was uh, pretty pleased when I, I heard from a friend of mine who works uh, for a major financial institution when he told me that his very expensive threat intelligence vendor pointed him to our free ransomware profile on our public facing website. Um, so he didn't feel too good about it because he's paying a lot of money for intelligence, uh, but it made us feel good. So we encourage folks to, to, to utilize those resources and, and 